Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sakaris, and I have an interview coming up in a minute with this gentleman you can see on the screen if you're watching. His name is Bruce Fenton. <laughs> And during the interview, I'm going to do my best to shoot down his theories. I've lined up a couple of points. But I got to warn you that at the end of the day, I'm going to probably have to admit that I can't. And that's a huge problem because Bruce Fenton and his wife, Daniela, claim to have done with their research is nothing less than crack the code on human evolution crack the code on our origins, and done it in a way that, I got to say, will completely upset everything you think you know about the whole out of Africa thing, the Darwin thing, and even more significantly, the who we are, why are we here thing. So like I said, I'm going to plow forward. I'm going to do my best. But I just have to warn you, your world may shift <laughs> rather radically about an hour, an hour and a half from now. Uh, Bruce, welcome to Skeptico. It's been so great getting to know you, and thanks so much for joining me. Thank you. It's a pleasure. I'm really looking forward to the chat, and hopefully um, yep, everyone will get something out of it. Great. Well, I've been leaving up on the screen this Skeptico Jeopardy board, which is a little game I like to play, but mm -hmm. let me back up and uh, maybe you could give us a brief bio of you. We could go on and on. It's just an amazing, your personal experience is amazing on a lot of different levels, mm -hmm. both in terms of uh, what you've experienced, experienced in the way that people talk about experiences and strange experiences, but also yeah. just in terms of your experience in terms of doing real research and interfacing with science and all that stuff. And then we could get into Daniela and your wife and some of the strangeness of that. I, I do want to bring it back to three books because we're not going to specifically talk about these books during the show, but we're going to pick out pieces. So I laid a lot on the table there to unpack, but tell us a little bit about who you are and maybe what these books sure. are all about. Yeah. I mean, I, in terms of, um, research and an interest in i suppose mysterious subjects whether ancient mysteries um the workings of human consciousness you know and a lot of other things you know my beginnings in that go back to perhaps 11 years old i i remember having a a collection of cards called the ancient mysteries of the world um set which they came free with tea leaves my grandmother would buy uh, and she'd give me these cards right? and they, they just got me an, you know an interest in these topics you had things like crystal skulls pyramids you know lake monsters all the strange things that you know we're all probably familiar with from mysteries and occult and all the rest of it that that's probably where i'd say i first got interested but in terms of real research i guess um probably from about 20 onwards you know i began to really dive into the literature on particularly ancient mysteries, um, you know, was there a lost civilization, you know, that kind of side, it really drew me in, you know, Egypt, the pyramids, etc. cetera. Um, I mean, in terms of my academic background, I'm an IT grad, so not, not an archaeologist or an anthropologist. Um, however, that, that has given me some useful skills, dealing with information and the flow of information, but obviously in a different way. And also when we come to the, the matter of, DNA, you know, from an IT person's perspective, you know, we tend to look at DNA code, you know, as code. You know, I know that some people will argue that DNA is not true code, but we just call it that. Um, I, I would say it is a true code, you know, so that's where, you know, my position. Um, also, yeah, I've done a lot of uh, traveling to various strange places around the world, you know, I, with Science Channel, I went out to the Caucasus in Georgia to hunt for giant bones. That was quite a, that was quite an adventure. I've been into the Amazon jungle to explore a, a megalithic complex there, which is um, from an unknown culture, and lots of other things. You know, Mayan sites, the pyramids. Um, so yeah, I've, I've been boots on the ground. You know, going to some of the the interesting places in the world, and also delving into the academic literature as well. So great. And you did a, a nice job and we could kind of go on and on there about stuff. Mm -hmm. But when people read your book, what they're going to find is you're a really smart guy. Mm 
and you go toe to toe with the paleontologist and the anthropologist mm -hmm. and you crush them and you've done your best. You know, you've shown me some of the email exchanges you've had with some mm -hmm. of those scientists who some of them are, are pretty nice and they've come to you and they said, wow, Bruce, I'm blown away by what you've mm -hmm. written. But uh, it's quite a testament to two things. One, okay. what a single person can do, how they yeah. can make a difference. And without the quote unquote proper credentials or without, you know, being inside an institution that protects them and all that, you can still make a difference out there. And the, the other thing that we'll talk about as part of that is just how corrupt, but also inept the academic process that we lean on, how doesn't serve our purpose, doesn't serve us answering these deeper questions of who are we and why are we here? And it's failed us over and over again. And I yeah. think your books are evidence of that. Can you give us a, just a very brief sketch of these three books that I have uh, pictured up here on the screen? Sure. Yeah. The, the Into Africa book, which is the theory, my sort of theory of evolution, the complete title of the Forgotten Exodus, The Into Africa Theory of Human Evolution. Uh, that book, uh, really, it came out of the work I was doing in Ecuador when I was exploring this megalithic site. Now, that seemed a bit strange, but what, what I uncovered was a link to a people called the Lagoa Santa down in Brazil. Now, they are quite mysterious, but they seem to be the first Americans. And what you find is that their morphology, you know, their skull structure, um, resembles that of Aboriginal Australians. Now, that was anomalous. You, you also find there's some sites down in Brazil that seem to be around 40, 50,000 years old. Now, that's hugely controversial. I mean, as, as you'll know, and most people know, it's been hard enough for academics to let go of the Clovis first model with, with a first arrival of modern humans to the Americas around 13,000 years ago. Which and, and at they, this point, it's overwhelming. I mean, the evidence it, yes. stacks up here and there and again, but you're- Absolutely. The, 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 I love what, the, the, what you just said is really important and I'm sorry to interrupt, but mm -hmm. I wanna highlight that. No mm -hmm. matter how much the evidence piles up, they will not let go of that. At least a, a, a large portion of that community will not let go of mm -hmm. that. It's been, yeah, they've, they've, they've fought the change tooth and nail. Uh, and even now where it's becoming you know, very clear and that they're having to acknowledge that there were, there were some settlements that are pre-Clovis, that they are still resisting incorporating the older sites, right? So there was recently, you may have seen there was a news story. They had a site about 15,000 to 16,000 years old. And it was, you know, it's like, wow, it's, you know, one of the, the earliest sites in the Americas. Well, only if you disregard a whole list of other sites that have been well dated, but are just too controversial for those, those skeptical, you know, conservatives in academia who say, well, no, no, we can't be, we can't be going straight back to 40,000 or 50,000, you know, 16,000, you know, that's tolerable, just, you know, just. And it's amazing. They say listed about three, four sites in this Nat Geo article saying, you know, these are the early sites. And, and for example, there's a, a particularly good um, location that the, I think it's the Bluefish Caves. And that was dated to 23,000 years, right? And that was many years back. The guy who did the dating, you know, he was a laughing stock for years. You know, his, his colleagues were making fun of him every conference. It was redated again recently, I think 2017, 23,000 years, right? Confirmed his dates. Now, that wasn't even on this list in that geo, right? So that gives you an idea of the thinking that's going on still, that, you know, we are not going to put these early sites on, no matter how many people confirm, you know, that they're, that they're genuine, right? Um, and that, again, prefaces a lot of what we're going to talk about, that, that conservatism and that dishonesty, really, in some areas of the academic field, right? That they do know that there's, these anomalies, if you like, which anomalies which can easily be rectified by changing models. But for now, they're anomalies in their models. Um, and that's just one example. But there's other, as I said, there's sites down in Brazil that are way older and there's academics down there that have been fighting for a long time to get recognition of the true depth of antiquity of these sites. Um, one of the problems they struggle with, of course, is that the field is really headed up by uh, Europeans and Americans and North Americans. So, if, if you're an academic from uh, anywhere outside of that, you tend to find that your work is sidelined, right? So 
there's, as I said, I had this conversation with someone recently that they'll say, we have realized that we weren't correct on something, you know, who is this we? This is the royal we of European and North American scientists, right? Talking down to everyone else, including other academics who did know something and who had perhaps had papers on it, you know, for years. But then eventually they conceded and say, oh, we didn't know. And it's, well, apparently other academics did, Chinese academics or Russians, you know, but they're not counted in that royal we, right? So <laughs> you'll find that happens a lot. Um, so it's, it's interesting you start to get to see how the dynamics of these um, fields work. Well, it, it is interesting. And, you know, here we are, we're going to talk 20 minutes in and we're still on the first slide. And I want to get over and talk about these other two books because they're really the meat of what I was hoping we would talk about today. Sure. But I can't leave that first topic because I think it, it highlights a couple points that I've already made and I'm going to remake is that one you are really doing the work. So boots on the ground in Ecuador, boots on the ground in uh, other archeological sites, really digging into the best research and trying to understand that. So that's the Into Africa book. And the other thing you point out there is just all the rather obvious ways that the sacred truth of academia isn't really something we should lean on. And we have to kind of drill that into uh, ourselves and other people because we're going to keep, it's hard to resist the temptation to keep coming back and going, oh, but this is what academia says. And, and even if it's a counterpoint, mm -hmm. even if it's saying, wow, Bruce has done such great job in the face of academia, at some point we got to go, no, the whole system is more fake than it's real. You just mm -hmm. mentioned the geopolitical part of it, right? So mm -hmm. if you're in China, you might have one agenda. If you're European, you might have another. American might have another. Well, that's not the way it's supposed to work. Or look at money, mm -hmm. how the money is distributed and the grants. And yep. Well, that's not the way it's supposed to work. But then take an even bigger step back, and we've had some exchanges about this on the Skeptical Forum and other places, is look at, the, at it as a control mechanism. Mm -hmm. If you say that there's a social engineering, social control aspect to all of this, which anyone has to admit there is, because mm -hmm. any government, any agency has an interest in controlling stuff. That's kind of yep. what they do. Well, if you're going to control stuff, one of the things you're going to want to do is control this kind of narrative. And that yep. doesn't mean that you control it on a daily basis or you're sticking the screws to some archaeologist. It just means at a higher level, you're making sure that the story goes in a particular way. And I think mm -hmm. that's the other thing that comes out of your, your work as as we look at it vis-a-vis -vis the official narrative, and it's like, well, of course, they're not going to be friendly to what you're saying. So let me shift gears for a minute there and do give us a quick overview of these other two books that we're going to get into. Oh, yes. I mean, I'm also there's a connection here because I've seen to Africa, one of the focal points is Australia. Now, and you'll find that is a focal point in the other books as well. Uh, the, the reason for that is, you know, I posit that Homo sapiens, our story begins in Australia um, and that there's essentially a couple of waves that come out of that. You know, so this really runs counter, of course, to out of Africa. Not necessarily completely. I, I, at the moment, the early hominins, you know, most of those fossils are in, in Africa. OK, but what I'm going to try is beginning to the Homo sapiens story, which is around about um, 780,000 years ago. OK, so I placed major events in Australia. I also think this is to do with why we have a kind of an information um, wall around this out of Australia, because it does connect to the other two books where we're dealing with what I say is obviously a, a, a manipulation in the genetics of early hominins and this this first massive i suppose leap towards true homo sapiens and modern humans and obviously it's not instantaneous it's not one day we have hominins and then we have modern humans there, there is still a process over which these genes express etc um but very quickly as well from the inter africa i should have said is that this is probably a key thing that people should look into i'll give a quick example of why the book is important because uh, recent out of africa is probably one of those famous models you know within anthropology that we come out of we come out of africa around about actually depend this is actually a key point depending where you read this 
you'll hear that we either come out of Africa about 60,000 years ago. The genetics, right, if you go to genetics, it's 60 to 50,000 years ago. If you go to the archaeologists and anthropologists, they'll tell you it's 70 to 80,000, right? There's a reason why you'll see that inconsistency everywhere, across articles, magazines, wherever you go, you're going to see this, that depending on who you go to, the geneticist will say one thing, the archaeologist another. This is because it's just two different events. There is a there is a movement into Africa 73,000 years ago from Eurasia, and there's, there's lots of evidence for this. There's uh, a movement of culture, you know, at first use of arrows, there's art that emerges, all sorts of things, new genes. And then 60,000 years ago, you have the initial migrations into Eurasia and those starting out of Australia. Now, I say that very quickly because that's thing, people can go away and look at that and you say, well, why would they hide that? I think there's, a, there's some kind of effort to keep us away from Australia and what's going on down there. And I'm not going to say this, and obviously, and in the earlier waves of this, again, I said there's been migrations out of Australia. So I just want to preface that, that there is something odd going on. That if I can find that inconsistency, I'm sure academics can. So I do find that odd that they can't notice there's definitely two models being merged together. So in, in the other books, we're going right back to that beginning of that Homo sapiens story. And I'm saying that, you know, we have hominins in the area. And this used to be controversial until a couple of years ago because it was thought there were no hominins down in Oceania, uh, Australia, or even anywhere in that region. Okay, but we now know that the, the islands of Indonesia were well populated. And they were populated by uh, Homo erectus and also, it seems, an ancestral form of Homo floriensis, the hobbit people. Now, this is going back at least a million years ago. Right. So this is before the rise of Homo sapiens. It's understood if you can make your way across these islands and through what's called Wallace's line, which is the geographic sort of barrier between Asia and Australia. Once you pass that, your next stop is Australia and there's nothing to stop you. You know, the major currents in that area, you've already you've already crossed them assumably in watercraft. Academics will tell you that maybe people got washed along in tsunamis, which is I think is a ludicrous absolutely ludicrous suggestion because you know you, you've got to imagine a whole community of people washed off of you know the coast of Asia carried across to one of these islands without drowning or being eaten by sharks or any other from and all arriving at the same time because to make a community you need a whole group of people so it's not just one guy washed off and carried Bruce, all of you have to be Bruce, carried there. Bruce I want to jump in there and sure. I want you to break that down a little bit further because mm -hmm. you got to read these books folks they're they're just just got to read them. I don't know how else to say it. Mm -hmm. Bruce does a really good job of breaking this stuff down, and I had to take it chunk by chunk and then reprocess it in some ways. And let me do that here. What sure. you're saying is, for a community from a genetic standpoint, you need so many gene pools in these mm -hmm. little people to survive. So some people yep. say fifty, some people say a hundred, whatever. But you, let's say you have to have but the difference, you have to have 75 humans in order to start mm -hmm. a new colony. And then take what you just said, the idea, the, the, the fact that ac some academic who's getting paid a salary, who's going to conferences and, hey, you know, everyone's patting him on the back, would suggest that, well, the way that happened is there was a giant tsunami. So, you know, we know what tsunamis look like. We can watch them on YouTube. Sure. Well, that all these people together got swept up in a tsunami and floated off, uh, you know, on various logs or whatever together, uh, you know, these great distances. It, it's just really kind of a, a silly proposition. It's, it's totally absurd because, I mean, for a start, one of the things we know is that tsunamis in open ocean, you know, they're just a, little, a ripple. You won't really notice. You'll just be bobbed up in the air briefly, right? They don't carry you along. It's not like surfing the tsunami. Uh, and once they hit, of course, they're so destructive that if you're standing on the beach and this, you know, this mega tsunami comes enough to wash, you know, your whole community into the water, the chances of surviving that initial event are so low. Uh, and now you're into what is some of those powerful currents in the world that move through those Indonesian islands, which move to the southwest, right? So why are they going to carry you east? You know, so we have all these these problems that even if you're out there in the world clinging onto a log, there's no reason that log will take you to the Indonesian islands. It will carry you off out, you know, to the southwest out into the open ocean. So it's I yeah, there's no reason that there's, there's no, no reason, reason that all the other logs or different debris are going to go in the same you know the no, same way over the hundreds of miles. Right. Mm -hmm. 
That's right. It's a ludicrous idea that we have this whole community founded in this one catastrophe and they all end up on the same island. You know, yeah, it, it, it begs belief that this is something that they will straight faced state in, like you say, in a conference or on a show, you know, they will tell us that that is their favored model rather than just simply saying perhaps they had watercraft. And, and again, we're, we're maybe, I'm guilty of it here. Maybe I'm kind of beating a dead horse, but I, I do think we have to grind on that because what you're about to do and what you're about to tell us is so, so hard for people to accept. I know it is. It's hard for mm. me to accept. It's mm, hard for other sure. people. We have to continually contrast it with just what a load of crap we've been fed. And it's kind of like, you know, you've, you've, swallowed a load of crap you've swallowed a load of crap with the out of africa thing mm -hmm. you've swallowed a load of crap with this thing that they're floating out there so maybe be a little bit more open-minded when bruce says hey i alone mm -hmm. doing my own little research here in wales have mm -hmm. cracked the code and said 780,000 years ago an event happened that is really the source of all of this stuff mm -hmm. and Maybe I have beaten a bad, dead horse. Maybe we should <laughs> jump into the the really heart of it and start with that 780,000 years. Because I have to tell you from just you've been on the forum and we've had a good conversation in reviewing this stuff beforehand. 780,000 years is the first thing that jumps out at people. They go, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, I've heard these alternative evolution origin stories. Why is this guy married to 780,000 years? What's the, what's the deal there? What's going on? So sure. let's start there. Why 780,000 years? Because this is a, a big jump off the, off the cliff alone. It, it is, and, you know, certainly that if you look into even other alternative models, you know, where people have argued for um, – some kind of event you know that has caused our evolution you'll find that yeah the dates are different you know i, I know that obviously sitchin offers a a popular kind of argument that around four hundred thousand years ago um humans were upgraded from homo erectus right by alien engineers that wanted them to be slaves you know that's a quite popular model out there in the um, fringe world obviously in the um mundane academic world that is not a popular model but so I don't, I don't agree with that. And I also don't agree with the, with the conventional model either. Now, one of the things that has been long accepted is that around about 800,000 years ago, the human brain basically goes into rapid, unexpected acceleration. Now, this has been known since we had a reasonable sized collection of fossils. It's not new. So what was missing from that was why? Because I think, why does the, the cranium suddenly go into this rapid expansion? Of course, things have changed a little bit now because we have genes, you know, we have genetic evidence, right? Which before we just had the skulls. Now, that's really been crucial. Like the work I do, you couldn't, you couldn't do with, you know, what we had, I guess, on the table, say, you know, 40 years ago or something, right? Because it is in those genes that we can see, you know, that something particularly radical happens alongside the brain expansion, right? Now, how did I ever get to <laughs> looking at that date, though? Now, well, that's why I, I hold have to on. Let me, let me interrupt again, and people sure. hate when I do this, but that's I right. don't care. I, I, one of the things I find really compelling in the book relates to this graphic you see up on the screen, right? Mm. And, and it relates to the point that you just made. For those people who are interested in the genetics and inf interested and are able to make the leap that you said at the very introduction to your story is that from an information processing standpoint, that's all DNA is. That's all genetics is. It's about information theory. Mm -hmm. And really, that's where the science has gone, right? So it, it, it's, it's really heading yep. in that direction anyway. But you make this phenomenal point, and it's good. We, we can almost, almost start and build it from start at the end and then yep. lay it back in. But I, I have up there, it's called chickens and chimps was one of the categories that I had on the skeptical board and I just brought up the graphic for it. And what it shows is this 350 million year evolution as it looks from a genetic standpoint, the difference between a chicken and a chimpanzee. And the difference is statistically insignificant. And then you have the difference between a chimpanzee and a human, 
over the last 800,000 years, like you're talking about. And it's unbelievably uh, rich. And there, the, you have to explain that in, better than I did. But also, okay. I want you to really hone in on how statistically significant that is, getting back to the science standpoint. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this was um, fairly recent revelations in science. Uh, what is it, they found that, yes, in these, in particular regions of the genetic code, now these are what's called highly conserved regions. Now, the, the why for that is that there are areas of the, of the, the human code, which if, if you change them slightly, or if there's a mutation, you essentially cause a failure. Now that either you will be, you know, born dead or born with, with such, such problems that you probably won't live a normal life and won't be able to reproduce, you know, so th these are catastrophic failures to have mutations in these areas, right? So what you'll find is across the animal kingdom, there's some areas of the code which remain very similar between, you know, pretty much all species, certainly within, I guess, higher animals. So if you take those there, you've got the example of the chicken and chimpanzee, you see that this is slight difference, basically three changes over 300 million years of divergent evolution. So we know that the, that the area that we're dealing with is so critical to life that it's extraordinarily rare that a mutation will, will happen that's in some way positive or neutral and will be retained going forward. Right, so people have to sort of appreciate that. These are these areas that don't just keep randomly changing regularly. Yeah, very stable. Now, what we see here is that since the split that's happened between chimps and humans, which around five million years ago, that there's been wild changes. And we know that some of these cluster around the time that that our lineages split from Neanderthals and Denisovans, again, which is around the 780,000 years ago. So we have a cluster of these then. There are some at other points, but there's a cluster there. Now, what the heck's going on here? Because we have leading academics that are examining these areas and saying, well, when we do the maths, we find that the, the chances of this happening by any known evolutionary means is a statistically zero, right? Now that, that's saying it really should, <laughs> I should hit anyone, you know, thinking, well, hang on a minute, this isn't Bruce saying this, you know, this is, you know, leading biostaticians, you know, working out the numbers and saying that, these should not be there. You know, in all of our models, these would not be there. And yet break that, break that down a little bit. I think it's such an important point. But my understanding of it is that 300 million years is a long, long time. Mm -hmm. it is, <laughs> it's yeah. a lot of generations. Mm -hmm. And if those generations don't change, don't show any change over that time, then they're really, really stable. So that becomes your base. Yep. So all these changes we see on the screen in pink become much, much more significant because Absolutely. you look at that and you go, oh, well, it's just three versus 18. Well, it's not mm -hmm. that big of a difference, but statistically, it's the time scale. It's the mm -hmm. time scale. Yeah. Yeah. That there's no way in those few million years that you, sh you shouldn't have even had one more change. You certainly shouldn't have about 18. One more would have been weird. You know, they would have had to have scratched their heads. Well, well, why did that happen? But to have so many and for them to be successful and in some way beneficial, because remember that for them to persist, they must be giving us a benefit, right? That's the other, the other and aspect to, here. to your point, for them to persist at the very least, they don't have to, they shouldn't kill you. Absolutely. Because the changes, very least. In, changes in those, in that sequence, yeah, right. <laughs> Uh, and the, the problem we have is not just one. This is a, a best example. It's called HAR1. Yeah, it's the, the best example of these. But the, essentially, there's areas called human accelerated regions because they found these regions that seem to have gone through accelerated evolutionary process, and they found a number of them. Now, I think they're up to hundreds of them, right, which are specific to us. You know, we don't find them in the other primates. Um, they've happened since our split, uh, and that there's hundreds. And they're not – these are not genes, right? This is – these are areas that are related to what's called um, genetic switches. These are areas that control the expression of genes. So let's just say you have a gene that will give you a, a certain length of arm, right? But there's also switches which will cause that expression to make you have a longer arm, shorter arm. You could even turn off the gene, right, which gives you that arm. So with these switches, you can do – so let's say if you were engineering something and you understood these areas – you could do remarkable things. You know, you can recreate an organism 
by modifying all of these switches, okay? So you're not adding in genes or taking out genes, not, not at that stage. You're just playing with these switches, right? But yet you can do extraordinary things. But if we were to try and do that today, it would be impossible. We do not understand the science well enough. Uh, and I say we would end up just killing the organism. If we make one of these changes, hoping for the best, it's almost certain it will die because we know that in 300 million years, only three were successful. So our chances of, of just stumbling on one, you know, at our stage in genetic engineering is minuscule, right? And yet we see these huge number of successes. Okay, can they be natural? Well, as far as we know right now, there's no natural mechanism which explains this. So the default in that then is, can it be unnatural? And I say, yes, of course it can, as long as there is something, i.e. intelligence somewhere, which is able to modify this deliberately. We don't really have a lot of other choices here because the academics are telling us, you know, this is 0% chance from what we understand. So what else can it be? You know, now some people say, well, have you just leapt to, you know, alien engineers? Well, no. I mean, I have other reasons why I go down that route. But there is implicitly a need for a solution to these areas. And I say hundreds of areas of the human DNA code. And we should add that from a kind of logic reasons and science, theory of science standpoint, it doesn't really matter how you develop your theory. What matters is your testing of that theory, right? So in a minute, mm -hmm. we're going to talk about how you even decided to look at 780,000 years ago. And if we look at the history of science, uh, there's plenty of cases where people mm -hmm. had a dream, right? Uh, yep. You know, for all yep. the way from Einstein to uh, Mozart in a different area. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's all over the place that people are accessing some other aspect of consciousness and get inspiration. So your inspiration, let's talk about this book that we have up yep. there and, and sure. as that is a starting point, but what we want to emphasize, don't lose track here. This guy is science all the way. So he's like, he can develop a theory, but then he's very rigorous about testing that theory. Yeah. I mean, you can have, I guess you look at it this way. There's, there's plenty of religious people in the sciences, right? For example, you know, they're, they're able to understand that they have their religious faith, perhaps their religious experiences, but they can also go to their day job, right? And do hard science. So, so if anyone says that, well, there's a contrast, how can you be this kind of, you know, esoteric thinker or mystic and yet be concerned with hard science? Well, there's, there's thousands and thousands of scientists that are doing that every day, right? That they're putting their, their belief in a pantheon of gods to one side while they do their lab work, right? So, so that shouldn't be implicitly a problem. Some people find it a problem, but it shouldn't be because we should be used to that. Now, the way it happened in this case is that, yeah, I read this book and Alteringa, when the first ancestors were created, came to me through a connection, a Australian um, friend that, that knew the book, right? So they sort of mentioned it to me because of some other experiences, personal experiences that I'd had. Uh, which made it relevant, uh, metaphysical experiences. And so I read this and I, really those parts of it that really grabbed me, particularly there was, there's a description of a craft coming to this planet, you know, in the distant, distant past. It says towards 900,000 years ago. So it's not given the exact date that I will argue for and I'll come to that, uh, but it's, you know, well far back in that period. And that this craft is basically destroyed there's a few survives that come from it. There's obviously a longer backstory to this, uh, that some of them survive, they come down to the planet. Now, one of the reasons why this really grabbed me is that many years ago, going back to about 2001, uh, I had a shamanic journey, you know, in which I saw events which were very much paralleled to this. So, so when I had, you know, put the two things together, I'm reading this book and I'm thinking, oh, that really reminds me of of some of the visionary experiences I had years ago, you know, with these beings in these uniforms as described in a craft coming towards earth, things I'd seen in that vision, which at the time meant nothing to me. And I'd put it away for years and years being, you know, just one of those things, a strange experience that you have no context for. Now, suddenly I had context, you know, <laughs> there's a book telling you, Oh, well this happened and this happened and this happened. And you can recognize that, yes, this seems to be very similar. Now, what was important about this book is that not only did it lay out, details of this craft you know roughly when it arrived how it's destroyed what it's made of the potential kind of debris that would be left 
but also other events in there which could be tracked. You know, a bombardment of asteroids a few years later, five years after this explosion, and a description of the creating of the first Homo sapiens, all clustered together, right, in, in a temporal space and in a physical place. So <laughs> I'm thinking, well, if, if this is true, and the author says, look, although she feels it's true, at the end she says, I'm not providing you science you know if you believe it you believe it if you don't you don't and you know she's quite honest about that she doesn't say you know you must believe my you know my book um because she's aware that she doesn't do what i do and go away and get you know scientific um evidence she, she leaves it as it is now i should clarify how does she get this story right and the way i would interpret it and it can be interpreted in two different ways but i'm going to interpret it in a, in a what i say a scientific way Right. that there is an artifact which comes into her possession, an Aboriginal sacred artifact called a Chiringa, right, or a Chiringa stone. Now, the law around these artifacts is that they go back to the original ones, go back to the dream time, when the first humans were created, when a lot of the landscape was created, when there was these, these beings that walked the earth, they call these this sky heroes or dreaming beings who walked the earth, right, and that they did all these amazing things. Now, an so aspect, let me just, can I just clarify sure. for a second? So you're mm -hmm. saying if you go to certain Aboriginal groups in Australia and say, mm -hmm. what are these things? They'll say exactly what you just said there. Yes, and that they, that they have within them the consciousness of dreaming beings from that dream time, right? Alturinga beings, okay? So you have an artifact which in its own law says it has an inhabiting consciousness of some kind of entity from the time when humans were created. That's in their law, right? So that's long before I've come around. I, I don't, you know, I'm not involved in making that up or, or claiming that. It simply is the Aboriginal law for these artifacts. Now, when you really think about that, that, that can be put into a con spiritual context, which they have, which is, you know, these spirit beings in these artifacts. But let's put that in another way. Now, let's say that there was a visitation to this planet in, in remote prehistory and that the beings left behind technologies that we cannot understand, technologies that would be essentially unrecognizable to us because they're so advanced and disguised in such a way as that for us, they don't look like much. Look like maybe, like they say, maybe it looks like a rock or it looks like just, you know, this <laughs> artifact because they, they know it's very special. They know it can communicate with them. It has a consciousness. So in their way of looking at it, it's a spirit being, right? But could this not be exactly what, we would call a bracewell probe because a bracewell probe essentially is um, a very advanced AI technology which can be sent out to other worlds. You know, obviously, this is theorized within you know, NASA papers that they, you can send out these things and they will act as sentinels which will sit on a planet, wait for a civilization to arise, you know, monitoring, tracking the whole time, and then at a certain point, these things could be programmed to activate and make contact with the civilization. Now, in this instance, it seems to be exactly what we have that's happened. This, this artifact, this inhabiting consciousness, which I would say could be an AI, it may not be a, a being in the way that we think about it, but again, then you come into a philosophical thing, isn't it? Is a hard AI that's self-aware, right? is it a being? I think maybe well, it is. Well, you also come into the, really, uh, the spiritual uh, mm -hmm. in, the, in a broader sense, understanding of it, because I think we do get locked into our space-time reality and everything has to fit into that. You know, we do have to incorporate in your shamanic journey. We do have to incorporate mm -hmm. in your dream experiences, mm -hmm. Daniela's dream experiences. And the reason I say that is because I've had a bunch of people have tried to explore that stuff scientifically. Do mediums really yep. talk to the dead? Does consciousness mm -hmm. really survive death? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yep. I'm not shooting down the AI thing, but until we can understand the larger extended consciousness reality, we don't really know. But I, no. I, the, your speculation is fair because what you're connecting it to is that, hey, that's what these people say it is. And sure. you had this experience with it and you it connected you with your past experience and then the real story is you said let me see if i can prove it absolutely you know at that point it, it can be ambiguous it doesn't matter if it's a spirit living in a, in a rock or if it's an ai in a probe right 
there'll be people who'll get hung up on that one or the other but as you point out there what really matters is is what it's telling us valid right so it doesn't matter you know it can be either and maybe they're the same thing but just from different cultural you know um, filters that the spirit being or the alien ai maybe they're the same thing you know i don't know but i can let other people decide for themselves which one fits into their worldview right because i'm not going to arbitrate that for people but what matters for me is the information again so we have this this object which communicates through voice to skull, which again, that could be technological. We have voice to skull technologies, or it could be metaphysical, could be telepathy. You know, again, these both. things are ambiguous, right? Could be both, right? It could be both. What matters is we know that the, both of those things exist technological voice to skull, metaphysical voice to skull. Okay, so I don't mind which one it was. This object communicates information directly into Valerie Barrow's head. It gives her this whole story of, you know, of what's happened. And again, this is quite funny because I mean, very recently, I, I think it's in a John Keel book, he talks about something called the, the Dark Knight, the Black Knight satellite. This is supposedly that they, years ago, they detected a satellite in orbit around this planet, right? Some, and he theorized maybe at some point it would provide a lost history of our planet. Now, that's kind of funny because it's exactly what this, this object does. It acts exactly as this story of the Black Knight satellite, that there's some alien probe which has recorded our story and is at some point able to then relay it to us. And that's what it basically downloads the entire lost history of our early origins, telling us that you know this craft arrives, um, it initially plans for a colonization event, that they are genetically engineering themselves to live on the planet, which is very reasonable stuff. Because you think about it, they, they can't just live on the planet. They're not suited, but they're using their own technologies to modify themselves to live here. Now, unfortunately, there is a, a complex exopolitical event, basically a betrayal by uh, some people on board and to another party that is at that time in control of this planet. There's supposed to be a handover. Instead, there's a, an ambush. This ship is destroyed. It's a vast kilometer diameter quartz crystalline ship grown from living crystal is how they describe it. it's not built it's grown and is inhabited by its own ai within the frame of the craft at first you'd think okay crystals woo you know but hang on a minute what are the leading edge scientists telling us that the future of consciousness is uploading into vast silicon networks right so we have this enormous silica network within which is the crew yeah. So the ultimate computer, you don't have the computer on board the craft. The craft is the computer. Imagine the, the processing power of a, of a kilometer diameter, you know, moon like craft, which is inhabited by AI. So it's fantastical technologies, magical technologies. So let's let's chunk this down sure. for a second. And Again, it's a I, lot, I, I know. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know to, to stop you or to just kind of let mm -hmm. it go because I, I, I love all the, the either deeper stuff that we could get into and in all this, but just let me bring it back up to speed. So Valerie has this download and I say mm -hmm. download because in the UFO community, we hear that all the time in sure. the NDE near death experience community. We hear that all the time that I reached this extended consciousness realm and I got a download in instantaneous, yep. like Encyclopedia Britannica, which is so outdated, but take Wikipedia. Wikipedia was suddenly just boom, popped into my head. And I knew the answer to everything. I'm not saying that Valerie said this. I'm saying this concept of download is well uh, reported over and over again in a number of different communities like the UFO abduction community and the NDE community. So Valerie has such a download. And then just to recap, the download says, hey, here's how you guys came into existence. There's this huge UFO and it came through this mm -hmm. portal that it's you real. can point to the Pleiades and that's mm -hmm. not really, it just kind of came through there. That was like mm -hmm. the the stop in the subway system and it zoomed exactly. over here and mm -hmm. boom, it was there. And then it somehow got destroyed. And cause there was this war between the planet. <laughs> it's really kind of crazy. Complex. But, mm -hmm. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, as you say, well, no, it is it's necessarily complex. I mean, I know that people would probably like it to be a simple narrative without, you know, a backstory of betrayed ships and alien alliances. And, but if that's what's out there, that's what's out there. Right. You know, there's, if it's weird and strange and it's alien, well, it should be weird and strange story for a start, right? Because, 
you know, it's an alien story, right? So again, I, I, I think that sometimes people get caught. And another problem I've, some people jump to is say, well, you say the, they come from the Pleiades. Oh, the Pleiades are a young star cloud. You know, there's no way advanced life could have formed there. Well, there's, there's two problems. There. Firstly, they don't say they live there, right? They, they've traveled from there, from a gateway. Doesn't mean that their, their worlds are in there. And this is multiple types of beings. So we can assume that they come from various worlds in various places, but their, their last jumping off point through this wormhole is the Pleiades. Secondly, we don't know what kinds of life are out there. I mean, are there life forms that live in these nebulous gas clouds within, you know, these um, young stars? We don't know. That's, that's truthfully, we don't. I suspect that the Pleiades may be entirely a manufactured cloud just to power their stargates. I don't know, but who knows? When you start dealing with, say, you know, type three civilizations who it is theorized they can you know move suns around and all sorts of stuff we have to be careful of the limitations that we would artificially put on what essentially are almost godlike technologies right where you know it's 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 so far ahead for us that it just sounds ludicrous right but if you look at our cutting edge thinkers in these sciences the kind of things that this download includes are the things that they're telling us they imagine advanced alien civilizations having, right? So there's a, a consistency there. And again, a lot of these things have come out only recently, these ideas. When Valerie wrote this book back in, well, she, the experiences are back in the early 90s, but she wrote, the, she published the book in 2003. A lot of these things we're talking about here weren't even out in, you know, in the conversation in the media, right? This, a lot of this stuff is quite recent, these ideas. She certainly, I, I can't see how she could be aware of things like voice to skull technologies or, or that, you know, uploading consciousness to silicon networks. These, these really are kind of cutting edge ideas, right? Now, so we can figure out wh whether they lived in the Pleiades. I don't think they did, but that certainly isn't, you know, a, a reason to dismiss it. Okay. Um, then we have, of course, yeah, this what I say is a logical explanation, you know, not only that the craft is how to AI, etc. That's why it's crystalline makes sense. But also we have, you know, they were going to genetically engineer themselves. They have those technologies makes sense. Explains well, hold, what they were going to do. hold on, hold on. Cause it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Right. To okay. a lot of people, it, it doesn't make sense. Their, their mind is blown, mm. but Bruce has done some science here that is in the make sense kind of category. Like I have the board up here and, you know, chickens and chimps, we already talked about. But, you know, I think a lot of people will say, that makes sense, Bruce. That's a strong argument. Mm -hmm. And you mm -hmm. bring us to 780,000 years ago in a way that makes me scratch my head and say, yeah, that is kind of strange. You got a couple other ones in here, buddy, that I don't know, but it is just too crazy. I mean, do you want to talk about tech tights do you want sure. to talk about tractor beam where do you want to go i think the tech tights because that is relating to the ship that we've already we've already discussed go just what are they and why is this like even a thing sure now tech tights are basically formed by extreme events you know extreme like there's a couple uh, thank you for the map you see there's been a, there's been a, a number of these a small number uh on this map, we can see here, there's been four major tectite events. You've got uh, one over in, in Africa, you've got another one over in Europe, and you've got one off in North America. But let's just make sure people understand. These are, these are meteorites in simple terms. Sure, impact, yeah. These are particular kinds of impacts. Now, I say particular because we, we only have four of these tectite strewn fields. So there is something implicitly strange and you know, anomalous about tectite strewn fields because we know this planet has been hit by many many meteorites asteroids you know even comets and if you go through the, the whole 4.5 billion years right we've been we've been whacked a lot of times but the strange thing is we only have four of these strewn fields where we get these these small pieces of material that have been melted they've been shaped usually into either dumbbell shapes teardrop shapes or small spheres and these are molten you know usually molten rock from both the object and from the the area itself that's been impacted right which are melted these thrown are, out. these are really 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 weird these are unique in these ones in are a unique a couple of different ways and the other thing about that chart that when i went and looked that I didn't immediately get is if you just go like I went to the University of Texas and they got this nice website and they talk about the tectites and they go, Hey, they happen from 
five million years ago to a million years ago, you know? And I'm like, mm -hmm. hey, what's Bruce talking about, man? These things, but now you dig the next layer like you just did. That's not really a very uh, meaningful way of telling the story. Because the real meaning is that, hey, these, these particular kind of very unique meteorites that have this kind mm -hmm. of... Uh, like a fast food or a, a snack food kind of core in the middle of one thing and another thing that melted on the outside. Really, that there, there are only four separate events that are separated by millions and millions of years. And the one that's really the most interesting jumps out, even when you just look at yeah. it on the map. Just a glance. And what's the, what's the dating on that? And that one's at 780,000 years. And that's, that's the thing. When I, when I went away to look up, you know, was there any material that matched the description of this craft breaking up? You know, that this, this crystalline, this quartz crystalline craft, you know, huge, uh, supposedly carried around 50,000 beings on board. So it was about an enormous thing, right? That it broke up. It's described that it came apart, it, was, it came apart, melted. It was a high temperature event. The energy weapons that were used caused it to shatter. There's resonance frequencies and heating. So it's like shattering apart, exploded, and a description of almost a nuclear type explosion at the end. And that then material rained down far and wide. And this is described in this download, right? So I thought, well, could it be that any of this melted, you know, raining material could survive to the present? Because we're not talking about, you know, iron or something that would have just rusted away, right? Because it's a silicate, there's the chance of it persisting for a very long time in the geological records. Now, so I went away and had a look and I thought, well, probably I wouldn't find anything, right? So, you know, you'd have to be quite lucky that even if this is real events, you know, you'd have to be quite lucky that something has been found, it's been analyzed, you know, and it matches up. Um, and so I was quite astonished to find that there was a 100 year long mystery around this material called Australite tectite. And that, you know, I guess a lot of geologists and chemists and stuff will know this. It's been studied by NASA. You know, I hadn't personally heard of it. You know, I guess a lot of the listeners maybe haven't either. Right. And what you find is that there's been this yeah, long standing argument over how it formed because it's quite unlike the other free tectite fields, right? Which are, again, they are rare enough, but out on its own is this vast australite field, which is, doesn't even doesn't even resemble the other strewn field, and it's just so enormous. You know, it covers something like ten percent of the planet's surface, right? Um, and it's not shaped in the way that we expect from an impact, which just throws out debris, you know, into a fairly omnidirectional way, which we kind of see in the other strewn fields. It's gone all over the place, and it's covering, you know, Australia all the way up to to parts of China, and then uh, you know, out towards Madagascar. You've got this vast strewn field, right? Um, that's an anomaly. It's very young. And so they assumed you'd be able to find the crater. This enormous crater should be glaringly obvious because as you point out, some of these other events are millions of years old and they found the craters, right? The, the Australite strewn field had no crater. You know, and that was one of the core mysteries, you know, because they can find that there's chunks of material. There are over 20 kilos in weight up in, um, basically up in like Laos. And so they thought, well, the crater has to be there because if you've got pieces that big, they're not going to have traveled far. So that's the crater. And you're looking around and there, there's nothing, you know, obviously we can scan these days. So they've scanned, there's no crater, right? And then there's other issues with this because, you know, the NASA studies revealed that one form of australite, these buttons that you showed, you know, in the image, they do look like a button shape, right? Or also like the nose cone of a re-entry vehicle. And that's interesting because NASA has looked at them partly because of that. They can see it's been shaped by the aerodynamic forces of, of re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. So they were quite interested in them. Uh, and they know for a fact that the only way this could have formed is if a large body was in orbit, and that's a key point, in orbit around our planet. So this is not an asteroid or comet flying in, hurtling in. Right? It has to be in orbit. Because it has a different angle, right? It has it, a different right. angle if it comes Very, straight straight in yeah huge speeds colossal speeds particularly because they know that this material has isotopic ratios in it which are signatures of being alien to our solar system right again so this isn't one of the asteroids from the asteroid belt which go at particular speeds usually these other objects that come in are coming in at hor horrendous speeds so the idea that they say a comet coming in from outside the solar system would be caught in the earth's gravity and start you know becoming a moon basically for, for the earth is astonishingly witheringly small for the, right but now you have this object which is orbiting us and then for no apparent reason explodes 
they say it has to have broken up in space and they know this because the material shows signs of having melted uh, formed spheres as liquid will in a vacuum right and then super quickly frozen again the cold of space right so they know that that was the formation process for the, the initial spherules right and that these then slowly make their way down at a fairly gentle angle of re-entry which allows them to form these these shield shapes rather than just burning up they come in at quite a shallow angle so you've got basically a, a deteriorating orbit and so they they make their way back in and they you get a whole shower of these and these are the what i'd say is the starting point of the re-entry um, zone so if you imagine where the craft itself has been destroyed now these mostly fell in antarctica and southern australia so this is why i say this is where the event has happened because that's the signature for it these little pieces that have been blown off of it and they've come in but then you have l larger chunks and that these have entered across you know, central to North Australia and Southeast Asia. And these larger chunks, as they came in, they become superheated. And so they turn into aerial bursts, colossal nuclear bomb-like explosions in the upper atmosphere. And they throw down material, which is now in the shapes of dumbbells, teardrops, spheres, right? Which is typical tectite shapes, not the buttons. The buttons are unique. They have to have formed from re-entry from, from space. So that's the, one of the key points. And we don't see that in any other strewn field totally unique in the 4.6 billion years of this planet now these how do we know there's aerial burst one of the mysteries of tech the ospelite tectites was that you find them in clusters on the ground and the geologists for a long time couldn't fathom that because an impact throws stuff out pretty much omnidirectional or you know even, even if you get it coming straight in it's going to be in a circle around it but fairly evenly distributed you don't find them in, in little patches and you could find a whole patch hundreds of them and then they stop you could walk for another hundred kilometers before finding another one Right. That's a signature for aerial bursts because wherever they've exploded, they've come down the ground straight underneath, but nowhere else. Right? So you've got many large pieces exploding in different areas across Australia and Southeast Asia. And this finally got proved, I think, a couple of years back. There's a geologist who spent decades, it's his passion, this subject, right? He spent decades trying to understand it. And he found a really unique piece up in one of the, I think, the Muong Nong tectites up in Laos. And it, it's unique because it has a fused second um, chunk stuck to it. He said the only way that could have formed is if you've had an aerial burst, you've got material on the ground. Hours later, a second aerial burst has occurred and a piece of material, by good luck, has stuck to one of the, the cooling chunks. He said at that point, you know for sure the only way this can happen is aerial bursts. And so this is not an impact. This is debris raining down from an object which has exploded in space. NASA told us has to have formed in space. And now we know there is no impact. These are chunks of debris from something. And they're coming in and they're exploding until eventually we get the end of the debris field up in Muong Nong, where you get these strange layered tectites, which again are quite mysterious because they don't really understand why they're in these thin layers. And I find that kind of funny because there's a lot of talk at the moment about metamaterials from UFOs, right, which are in layers. And we keep getting these pictures from, you know, um, TTSA and uh, whatnot that have these layers. And it's very strange. If you look at Muong Nong tectites, you'll see actually they're in layers like that. Uh, again, nobody really knows why. Theories why. Nobody's, <laughs> nobody understands them. Um, so you have there a hand-in-glove match with the download information. Right. Even down to what it's made of, there's a NASA paper that says that they are largely silica, about 75% silica from melted quartz. And quartz doesn't even form right, in space, in asteroids. It's, it normally forms in planetary systems. But it, you don't find chunks of quartz flying around. Right? It's even so rare on the moon that when they found some, they deduced it had to be from a meteorite from Earth that had been you know, knocked off to the, to the moon because they don't really get quartz there. Yeah. So, so, so just to just to recap for folks, the the story, you mm -hmm. Valerie gets this download of information about this crazy Hollywood story sure. about a spaceship that comes and they blow it out of the sky versus this war in heaven kind of thing. It yep. blows up. It's a crystalline thing and it falls to Earth. And Bruce here goes, you know, I'm just crazy enough to go look for evidence for that story because it matches up with a, half, a, a metaphysical experience yeah. I had, mm -hmm. I'm going to go see. And you have the brains, the, the, the smarts to say, okay, how would I go about doing that? And then mm -hmm. you say, geologically, maybe there's, maybe there's still some stuff around, crazy as it may be. And then like you just said, hand in glove. I mean, you just go through and I, I won't do it here. 
<laughs> but you know, go through all the checkpoints of great mystery. No one ever did you know, it. They, they acknowledge it's a hundred year mystery. Yep. Acknowledge that this one is 780,000 years old. Acknowledge that it's especially strange. Acknowledge that there's no crater. I am going through all of them. It, yep. It defies explanation by normal means. And I think people have to appreciate that you've done it the right way. You know, you've gone and looked for the data. It's not your fault that the data completely falls in line with this rather remarkable story. No, there could have been nothing, right? I could have gone and looked and found nothing. That, That was the most likely event that, you know, you think, well, even if it was true, that just you simply didn't find anything, you know, they hadn't discovered any material. You know, I'm reliant on the academics in these things because you know i don't go out and do geology or archaeology again so um you know i'm a layman so i have to see what's in the records you know in the papers in the finds and so by luck you know people have been out there and they found them and they've analyzed them so you know i haven't had to you know go and do some sort of you know oh in my woo lab in my garage you know i've analyzed them. no i mean there's these are peer-reviewed academic papers again you know nasa papers as well. i know we don't like nasa but you know they do, <laughs> do good work uh, and also we've got independent universities geologists you know it's, it's not one it's not one organization right there's lots of different people have looked at Australite tectites, you know, for lots of reasons. And as I say, it's even got a signature in there in the isotopic ratios that it is alien material, alien to this solar system, right? So that again is another important point that is these, not even the, the makeup of the object is also not in line with asteroids, comets, or meteorites that we know. Again, it's got a strange ratio of different, com- lots and lots of different chemicals in it, but strange ratios of chemicals again. So there's a lot of reasons for them to, to decide that this isn't, you know, a standard object yeah and the fact that it has silica from melted quartz again signature of that this is a very strange thing to be orbiting our planet this huge chunk of you know sort of silica and aluminium but with a lot of other sub compounds that what the heck is it doing there you know and then as you trace that down you can always imagine this thing coming in over at like antarctica and breaking up and you can see the, lo- the logic of this with these pieces from space until it starts to hit the atmosphere and then you get a different you get the aerial bursts, and then at the very end of the trail, you get these strange muongnong layering, which I assume is the closest to the undamaged material that we're going to get. You know, these are the final chunks, if you like, or the molten material that has ended up right at the end of that decreasing flight path, right? So we can trace it all the way down from Antarctica to Laos as it breaks up and comes in. Very, you know, very strange, but absolutely, yeah, meshes so well because we also are told in this download that the escape crafts land in South Australia. Now, if they're fleeing from an exploding craft, I'm thinking they're not traveling too far. You know, it's like get to the ground <laughs> as quick as you can. Yeah. Again, Star Wars, we hate to do it, but I mean, this is right sure. out of Star Wars. You got the mothership and then you got the other ship. You hear it from UFO accounts all the time mm-hmm. there's the big ship and then there's the little ships and that's Absolutely. what you're saying happened yep. uh, uh, let's jump forward in the story before we uh, run out of time because sure. we, we've talked about i think if people are following along i don't know how good of a job i'm doing of helping them do that probably not we talked about the chicken and the chimps and how that gets us to 780,000 years now we just talked about the tectites and how that unbelievably gets us to 780,000 years. But there's another part of the story that you (laughs) amazingly, again, you just went out and looked for, uh, just tell the story about the the tractor beam. Tell us Mm -hmm. where that fits into, again, our Hollywood movie, and then where the evidence is for it. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And I will quickly say as well that, you know, from what I understand, Valerie actually has had at least one, person come to her and talk to her about possibly making a movie and i actually think it would be a brilliant movie absolutely brilliant right because it is it's actually it's action-packed you know it's not just that we've discovered you know these scientific you know anomalies but you know it's actually yeah it's an extraordinary story in its own right um but yeah with the tractor being part basically that we are told that five years after these events happened uh, another group of extraterrestrials associated with these colonists if you like or scientists you know, arrive to earth and that these are a kind of police force you know they are associated with this alliance but rather than being the peaceful colonists that have arrived initially these are kind of yeah cosmic cops of some sort right that they come armed um there is repercussions against this betrayal so they warn the inhabitants of earth that are the current you know inhabitants of earth that they should leave as per the original agreement 
that they have destroyed, you know, a peaceful colony ship, uh, broken the treaty, and that there's going to be consequences. And so to leave immediately or face a planetary bombardment. Now, it's explained that this planetary bombardment is not, you know, laser beams or, or anything conventional that we feel like that. That what they do is they, say they pull in asteroids and that they will utilize those to bombard a planet's surface. And they clarify that, you know, if we need to, we can pull in something big enough to crack a planet open. Right. So this is worse than you know, nuclear warfare. They can just wipe out your planet if they want to. Right. And it, you basically think of things like the dinosaurs, you know, was that deliberate? Who knows? But they, they, they say they're quite capable of pulling in objects like that. They then go about this bombardment, right? That the underground bases of this second party are sort of are targeted. There's a pulverizing of the planet. I assume that something like that would be well known that, you know, we'd have heard of it in the same way that we've heard of the, the extinction of the dinosaurs, that this would be like, you know, oh, and then of course there was another event like this 780,000 years ago that we'd all know it. So I, I was quite skeptical that I would find anything to support this. Um, but I went away and looked and it turned out that just, I think it's in 2015, uh, I'm pretty sure 2015, a German geological team had basically uncovered evidence of a multi-directional planetary bombardment by asteroids, right, which had led to a global cataclysm, firestorms, tsunamis, earthquakes. <laughs> Until 2015, no one knew that. And keep, keep in mind that you know, we're dealing with a book published in 2003, so there's no way that Barry could have gone out, you know, looked this up and just included it because it would be exciting. You know, nobody knew. And it's so weird, again, another anomaly, because you expect an asteroid on its own to come in. You don't expect many of them to hit from different sides of the planet at the same time. And they even say the composition seems to be different. So it's not from one breaking up asteroid. These are separate objects pulled in. So, so the, so the Germans, as they're reporting this, are going, wow. Again, like your tech type thing, they're going, Another wow, anomaly. this is an incredible anomaly, an incredible mm -hmm, mystery. Mm -hmm. How could this ever happen? And you're right. sitting back there going, well, this exactly fits what I totally was matches. looking for. Yep, and it's an anomaly on anomaly because, you know, we've already got, you know, we've got this anomalous object and how it breaks up. We've got this, you know, now we've got this anomalous bombardment. And then, of course, we've got anomalies in the genome which you know we've tackled some of those but there are more and that the dating again for the the important most important changes in early hominins that lead to us they again tied to this period around 780,000 years ago now that was one of the crucial things for me is that if I could find the evidence that supported this narrative it also had to be in the same time zone right because it's no good to saying that 500,000 years ago there was a bombardment, a million years ago there was a, a silica craft. You know, to be a true story, all of the major events have to be happening at the same time, right? And that, that's what I found, that they are. Right. So maybe we've left uh, a, a big, we've implied this other part of the story, but I think we probably should, should go ahead and, and get to it because as the story moves on, and I'll let you tell it, these beings, they land in Australia and they say, wow, we can't really fulfill our original mission, but we can kind of get there by doing some genetic engineering, genetic ma manipulation, which we, we th th this is like, we're going to have to have so many interviews on this, or maybe we'll make the movie, you and I together, we'll talk about that. But that. But their thing is like, okay, we do this all the time. Like this isn't, if you really wrap your head around what you're saying, you have to accept that this is just kind of how stuff works. They knew about the planet long before this. They maybe visited it long before this. This is just one event that happened 780,000 years ago. Correct. They weren't able to completely fulfill their mission. So they kind of went into this mode. Okay, well, let's do the thing. You know how we do the genetic engineering and how we did it over there. And we're always doing genetic engineering and it's been done on us. And we do it on other beings and consciousness no evolves more. and it goes into all these different things. And hey, let's mm -hmm. see how it works here. And what I thought was particularly interesting here because it reshapes our understanding is this idea of the garden. So mm -hmm. if, mm -hmm. if you could bite off all that stuff that, uh, that I, I'm saying on behalf of you and Valerie, then what do you do? You know, you, you, you got this planet and you have these kind of uh, different uh, beings that are running around that maybe you had a part of in the distant past, but right now you're ready to do something I, I haven't done a very good job of explaining the story, but pick it up there with maybe this idea of the garden. Yeah, sure. I mean, and that's right. I mean, this is another argument that people say, well, how, 
aliens wouldn't come here because they don't know we're here, you know, et cetera, et cetera. No, no, no. It's explained, you know, in the beginning that this is a planet that's been seeded. You know, this is being seeded by DNA, by advanced beings in the beginning, you know. Um, so the beings out there are well aware of Earth. You know, it's been a planet chosen to be seeded, okay? Uh, that there have been beings on this planet in the remote prehistory, again, that have lived here, that are, uh, we would consider them extraterrestrials. Are they? If they've lived here long enough, you could argue they're as terrestrial as we are, right? right. So again, there's, there's arguments for that. But there are, they have played around with the DNA. And in fact, it's, there is explained that at some point this planet was lost to this other party after the seeding and that this other party played games with genetics, created dinosaurs, did all sorts of stuff. And that later on we have this transfer back. And this is what this agreement was about, this ret returning the planet back to this alliance. <clears throat> And that obviously with this betrayal. So there's been a lot of going on on this planet long before this, that we're just dealing with the, the event that has the most evidence, right? They're, they're saying there's a lot more that's happened right from the beginning. Yeah, you know, it's always been a garden, always been uh, DNA being manipulated and whatnot. Creating the first hominins was a manipulation, right? The, you know, Homo erectus being raised up from those hominins and being a larger brained, you know, the earliest kind of, I guess, recognizable humans, again, that someone had a role in that. And that now at 780,000 years ago, a different party is saying, well, our plan hasn't really worked out of colonizing, but what we're going to do instead, we're going to use what's left of our technologies to upgrade the hominin that's here. And we're going to utilize it to continue our plan of essentially colonizing this planet, or taking over this planet back to alliance control. And that we're going to use these beings almost as biological spacesuits. Now, this is something that people are going to struggle with a bit, but if anyone knows Tibetan Buddhism and the, the idea of directed incarnations or directed reincarnations, that some people, not just aliens, but some people can direct their next life. And reincarnation, as far as I'm concerned, has been established by the work of um, uh, Professor e, is it St Ian Stevenson. Stevenson. Ian Stevenson, Jim thank Tucker. you. Yeah. If, if even leading skeptics who've looked at his work say, you know, they have to say that, well, you know, yes, his work is, you know, is rigid, is solid, is totally scientific, but we don't believe reincarnations because, because they're unable to accept his evidence, right? Not because his evidence has anything wrong with it. Yeah. So as far as I'm concerned, it's established that reincarnation is real. Now, these beings say, well, they can incarnate into these humans as they dying you know they cannot survive here because the atmosphere is not right for them the, the solar radiation is not right there's uh, bacteria in the water all sorts of problems you imagine if you were marooned on a world right <laughs> which you were not ready to live on so they have those real world issues but what they can do is create an organism which they themselves can utilize and they can then move into as they die and that's exactly what they do and just let me uh, jump in there. This is kind of a little bit of inside baseball, and we're going to have another in sure. interview and include Daniel in here because there's, there's so much to talk about. But I'm not sure I'm totally – I'm on board with part of what you're saying, mm -hmm. but again, it, 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 the balancing of the metaphysical extended consciousness and this mm -hmm. narrow idea of time-space has to be incorporated in because we don't really know mm -hmm. what reincarnation you know, means and what means would be no. the purpose of that. And mm -hmm. if there is either – because there may be some cases where there's this higher spiritual purpose and there could be another way that there's just kind of a tech, more of a technological yeah. kind of, I move my spirit from here to there. We don't know if it's a mixture of that or mm -hmm. what it means. We don't know what the goal would be. You know, some people could pick that apart and go, well, a directed reincarnation, how does that really get you where you want to go? Well, we don't know where you want to go. We don't know what the goal would be. Sure. I, I think what's important is we just hold the idea, uh, you know, we can go down all these paths and we have to, mm -hmm. but hold to the idea of, of what you're saying is that it is not, it, it, it is reasonable to throw that on the table and say that there could be a purpose that mm -hmm. would make it reasonable to prune the garden in such a way that the certain species evolve in a way that is a merger of the the genetic makeup of both parties we might not mm -hmm. understand mind of god what that purpose was or mind of ai what that purpose was was but it's not unreasonable to assume that i don't think well no and, and again you know what they say it's for and if they can say it's that we can't substantiate and we can't know that that's not just 
what they would like us to think on that particular thing because you can't substantiate it. All you can say is that in their download, they explain that that's part of why they're doing it. There's other reasons as well. Yeah, that are more complex into bigger vision things about this sector of space, the other entities that are here, what role this planet would play, why they would want a, a sort of foothold here. So there is a larger narrative they offer but you can't really substantiate that unlike the debris unlike the genetics you know again because then you're dealing with what they say it's for not necessarily what it's for so we have to acknowledge that the way you can't substantiate then you just have their version of why they're doing it so you could have called it it could be propaganda right it could be real could be propaganda. because there's some parts of course of the narrative that you can't easily just validate you know you can't find a physical thing to validate something which is just their opinion on what will happen by doing this, right? But so what, you can we, do, what you can do, and I think it's important, and I'd love for you to speak to this for a minute, the garden model that you're kind of outlining does solve for a lot of kind of nagging problems that people have run into when they speculate about particularly uh, genetic engineering by non-human intelligence. You know, they run into problems, well, well, they would just kind of do it this way or that way. And like, in particular, what you point out is, well, you, you, you really couldn't factor in for everything, you know? You couldn't factor into natural catastrophes, you know, the changing of the sun, or you get hit by a meteor, you know, stuff happens. You can't completely control the uh, process of evolution and natural selection genetic mutation no. you can't completely control that and what it moves you into i think naturally is what you're outlining here it's like hey well that's you know that's what a gardener does you know one year he gets a drought it, he like he lives through it and he lives sure. through the next year one year he gets a, a mutation that doesn't quite go his way and doesn't produce any fruit Okay, he lives with it, he kind of goes. It, when you switch into that model, it, it gives us a different way of thinking about uh, non-human intelligence and their role in doing genetic engineering. It, it mm. makes sense, what you're saying. Yeah, because we, we do it, don't we? Like, so, you know, if we have a garden, we will, we will hybridize, we modify, we direct breeding. We do all sorts of stuff to, to, to leave things how we want it in our garden, and we will weed the garden when we need to. And if we look at some of the cataclysms in the past, we have no way to know whether these are all incidental, you know, or whether they're directed because there's certainly been periods where strange things have happened. I mean, there's the Cambrian explosion, which is obviously a big issue. There's certainly loads of life forms appear out of nowhere, but conversely, there's also die offs where we've been reduced down to, to, to tiny numbers. You know, is that again, is that to direct certain groups to survive while others are removed? You know, we don't know, but we do understand that if you are gardening that sometimes you weed the garden, right? So, is there times when certain species are removed and, you know, certain populations of people even that, you know, if we go, and I say people going back, we've got obviously long periods, it could be hundreds of thousands of years ago, but even more recently up to say 70,000 years ago, there was a huge die off, right? A climate event, Lake Toba, all sorts of things that happened and we were reduced to a small population. Again, I'm left wondering with some of these, you know, <laughs> are they all just natural events? They could be. Or are, are some of these deliberate, you know, that, hey, we'll rain down a virus that, you know, will remove such and such groups of people or such and such animals, and they will be removed, you know, because there being a problem. We have, to, we have to ask ourselves that once you put in a intelligence that is godlike in terms of its abilities, you know, it's not what we think of as a true god, but it can do incredible magical things, that then you have to relook at all of history and ask yourself, would any of these events fit with the influences of a power like that? The die-off of the Neanderthal is one thing that a lot of people have pointed at and said, why doesn't that survive? In a lot of ways, it seems to be more fit for survival and yet we have this huge die-off i mean there's over many many examples of this stuff right? well yeah and i think that's shaping like seventy thousand years ago there's this radical event that kills off most humans and so in the northern hemisphere I, I think that does shape modern humans i think that the survivors of that event are pushed together and it's the final hybridization of the ancient hominins which gives rise to modern humans. Before that, there's no true modern human, not fully behaviorally, anatomically modern humans, not till 70,000 years ago. And I'll argue, definitely argue, people can have a look. And in fact, you have the cultural revolution begins after 70,000 years ago, right? Where we start producing all of these art, you know, complex art where we link different things together, like with a reticular language, all these things start to emerge, yeah? Uh, 
I believe that's the coming together, the survivors of the Denisovans, Neanderthals, and probably dozens of other groups that we don't know yet because we don't have their DNA on record, that modern humans are a hybrid probably of dozens of populations. And so the idea that modern humans existed alongside Neanderthals and Denisovans to the beginning, I think is a misnomer. We're going to slowly see that we actually are the combination of probably 10, 20, 30 populations that have yet to get names because we haven't found their bones or their DNA. Right? But we know already we are not a singular, pure you know, subspecies whatsoever, that we've got at least about six different archaic hominins DNA in us so far, spread between different populations. Right, So I, I think that, again, you could ask yourself, was that a deliberate event? Is that the final push that, hey, we've got all these different groups. Let's get the best of all of them into one population. Let's do something that shapes that and makes it happen. Ooh, a cataclysm. <laughs> that will push them together you know so we don't know once you've got that kind of model behind you think well someone else is watching from the skies and you see these sort of almost convenient for them type events right that if you are looking for a final superior model by bringing them together near the end well that just about fits what we're seeing on the ground well you know and there's so many points to cover there but this model that you're putting forward as i mentioned I think helps move us towards being able to answer some of these questions. It's an impossible mm -hmm. model for 99% of people yep. out there to even mm -hmm. approach, but that's too bad. You know, we just have mm -hmm. to kind of push forward with what we have. But uh, what I particularly like about the garden idea, the garden metaphor is that it incorporates all of what you're saying, but it also incorporates more, which, you know, we'll mm -hmm. touch on maybe when we talk again, but the, the abduction phenomenon is something that we have to, kind of deal with and understand. So we have that as well. So the garden would suggest I'm doing all of those things. I'm pushing mm -hmm. groups together. I'm separating groups. There's natural uh, catastrophes there that I'm kind of engineering. There's also natural catastrophes that I'm not engineering. And then every once in a while, I'm doing a specific uh, CRISPR of my own making, you know, going in there and kind of tweaking stuff. And only when you put all that stuff on the table, can you start piecing together something that really incorporates in a lot of the data that we have. And you don't wind up telling stupid stories about mm -hmm. how tsunamis drifted people out in the ocean, you know? Sure. And those should be the stories that people should be actually saying, you know, is ridiculous. But because of the appeal to authority that goes on, you know, that something that we could say that someone would say is ludicrous. You know, yeah, if an academic said it, they say, well, that seems quite reasonable. You know, and, yeah, and then conversely, an academic can say something totally ludicrous that if you, you or I came up with, people would think it was so stupid. You know, it, it's an unfair balance, right? Because... You know, if something's ridiculous, it's ridiculous. If it doesn't have evidence, it doesn't have evidence. It doesn't matter whether it's a leading academic saying it or whether it's us saying it, right? You know, that it has to be reasonable and it has to be supportable, yeah? So no matter how wacky things sound at the, the onset, as long as the, you can go down, drill down and say, well, actually, this is reasonable, there's support, you know, then it's okay, you know? Um, if it doesn't have that, then, well, it's beliefs, isn't it? It's just wild beliefs, you know? You can believe a tsunami carried people. There's no evidence, but, you know, it's a wild belief that you can hold if you want to. Um, I think people need to look at it a bit more like that. Like, so they can say, well, what you're saying, Bruce, is really wild stuff. Yeah, okay, but it's supportable wild stuff. It's not stuff that's divorced from real world evidence. I mean, and, and I know we talked about the HARs, but it's not just that. I mean, I, someone could go away and say, okay, well, you know, we found these differences for a chimp and it was really weird, you know, okay. But it, it's not. I mean, there's, there's far more than that. And I, I know there won't be much time, but I'll say that, you know, we've got genes that literally appear out of the non-coding DNA. You know, these academics try to say, just appear suddenly fully formed out of the non-coding DNA and happen to give us, you know, the neocortex or something, you know. And there's another, oh, this one, it looks like it's been cut, copied, and put back in. A guy says Xerox. It looks like it's been Xeroxed. You know, when a, an academic uses a term like it's been Xeroxed, you know, are they trying to tell us something? Because to me, that's an implicitly strange thing to say. It looks like it's been taken out, cut, Xerox, put back in. <laughs> what are you trying to tell me here? And then elsewhere, you've got this fusion of chromosome two, which, which yes, chromosome is confused, but this one's fused on an active gene, which is to do with our, our reproductive system, immune system, our brain, again, the brain. And then you find all these anomalies between us and chimps. They're all clustering in the brain, right? That what's the chances? You say a random mutation, random mutation. Well, I would expect to see changes in the kid knees, the leg, you know, the stomach, the eyes, but that's random, right? Hundreds of changes that give us our brain, our modern complex supercomputer brain, that doesn't look random anymore. And when you find they're not just in the genes, but they're in these switches as well, and that, you know, throughout the system, you're finding what looks like bizarre changes 
throughout the genetic system, right, that have gone about creating our brain. And this brain is not a clear advantage when, when it first begins. Now it, we can say it is. But we lost energy going to our muscles, right, at a time when we were fighting tooth and claw to survive. What was the benefit of this fledgling brain? That was reproduction. Us- reproduction is a, is a real, it's a real hindrance. It's a hindrance. Suddenly you've got, you've got all the other creatures around you are going, you know, essentially become stronger because you're becoming weaker and, and you're yet to develop even stone tools or, you know, um, bows and arrows. You've got nothing particularly that's compensating. So suddenly you're, you're a weakening creature giving energy to a, a calorie hungry brain. And, and then you have a larger people, head that won't pass, larger head. People pass through the birth them. canal. There's more Problem. death at birth. Yep. Then, you know, so well, that, gets, that seems to get weirdly fixed as well, because then we become a highly neotenous right, creature, which means that we retain the characteristics of an unborn fetus when we're born. We're essentially a fetus, right? So they've gone around the problem by making us be born earlier, and then the brain continues to develop at the same rate, but outside the womb. And again, these are sort of suspicious, strange changes. That, that, you know, and we have gone on to become more and more neotenous. We've got a lot of these- And they're suspicious for a couple of reasons. We're just gonna jam mm-hmm. a bunch of stuff in sure. here at the end, but like, hey, you know, you go watch uh, your National Geographic show and you see the little deer that's born and an hour later they're up and running <laughs> around. around. <laughs> yep. Hey, that doesn't exactly happen with humans. You know, they kind no. of- so that's not really with an chimps, advantage. With our close relatives, the chimps. Are, and and the, if you look at the, the agony of childbirth and the deaths in childbirth amongst humans versus chimps and other primates, they don't really have those problems. They don't really have them. They have a shorter childbirth. It's very rare for them to die in it. It's usually not agonizingly painful. Uh, and there's sweeps of strange errors as well, not just upgrades, you know, but strange errors, particularly in our reproductive systems. You know, so, I mean, particularly for if women, how they feel like, oh, I'm cursed by God or saying, you know, I'm having these problems. No, there's, there's weird errors that mean that we are handicapped in that. And that, you know, it's, it's so common to have spontaneous abortion, you know, early stages and difficulty with pregnancy. And they found that there's loads of strange genetic anomalies, which are different to the other primates, right? Which only exist in us. Uh, and some of these are very baffling changes because at the end of the day, reproduction is the key, isn't it? Right. So, that you would develop a change in your DNA that makes you less able to reproduce, and yet it persists, is a bizarre anomaly. Because like you're actually worsening as a species, technically, versus everyone else. And yet, those things are persisting. So there must be benefits that came alongside the time that those horrible mutations happened. Well, right? it, it, and, uh, but that could take us in the wrong way. I mean, I, I know exactly what you're saying, but not necessarily benefits. That's what we're saying. It could be from the outside, someone is saying... I want to engineer it this way. So the gardener yeah, doesn't I mean, necessarily, the gardener's benefits aren't nature's benefits. Not and we got to, yeah, not mix those two together because no, normally also, when we talk I mean, about you, benefits, we talk about natural selection and ability sure. to thrive. And we're not talking about those kind of benefits. We're just talking about someone wanted it that way. Well, it could be because you think if you have genetic changes that are done, they may have more than one effect. So let's say that they do confer a benefit to you somewhere else in your system, but they come with a horrible negative, right? Where you, know, you end up with some other problem, but because the advantage was so good, you go on carrying the damage as well with it, right? So this is a problem that you won't, and it won't, it will take a long time to fix that. And we haven't had long enough. So if you think these events, if this really happened 780,000 years ago, evolution's not had enough time to address all of these problems, right? So there are things that may over time, we'll, we'll start to see some of these things fade, but it, it takes a long time. You know, evolution is a, let's say the blind watchmaker or whatever, you know, it, it, it doesn't go in and say, well, let's just fix these errors. You know, it, people have to die off because of them, etc. you know? So we, we may find that what's happened is alongside the upgrades, some of these things came along with it, but the upgrades were so, you could say, beneficial that they have compensated for the downgrade elements, right? And, and that, again, is an anomaly that you, people need to look at and say, well, yeah, why would we evolved to have, you know, a, a more difficult reproductive system, you know, that doesn't really function properly versus all the other primates. I mean, you know, there's stuff like that that I, I'd like people to also focus on, not just, oh, we got a bigger brain and that's the anomaly. Like, no, no, there's, there's a large list of anomalies in the human genome. Well, Bruce, we could go on and on. There's so much that people are going to want to check out on all three of those books. The newest book I have up on the screen Exogenesis, mm-hmm. Hybrid Humans, please go pre-order it. It's not out for a few more months, but it does a good job of pulling together a lot of the information from the other two books and largely your work, which people can find. Tell us how people can 
catch up with and stay up with what you're doing and what you're doing next and how we're going to get more of this information out because you and I have to mm-hmm. have to make sure that this gets out to as many people as we can. And for people who I, I didn't do my job at the beginning of this show, I said I was going to shoot down your theories and I just fell into making it a big love fest. And I apologize <laughs> to everyone who's listening. So please shoot this guy down, mm-hmm. tell him where he's wrong, yep. tell me where he's wrong, straighten me out because I mm-hmm. fell for the whole, I've fallen for it hook, line, and sinker. I think it's hugely important. So mm-hmm. correct me on that. But I, I digress. Sure. Bruce, tell us where we can follow what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, if, um, if people would like to just sort of catch up with me, I'm generally on Twitter. They'll find me there under Exogenesis, um, my handle there. Uh, also, I am on Facebook. I don't use it an awful lot. I have websites, brucefenton.info, hybridhumans.net, um, ancientnews.net, and earthrule.net, which are, you know, control all of those. Um, I have recently been on Ancient Aliens, and I believe I'm, I'm in another episode coming up fairly soon. And I should be at contact in the desert next year, all going well. Obviously, that's a few months away. So if people want to see me there, so I'm based in the UK, obviously, so I'm not in the US a lot. So that'd be an opportunity for people to come and either, I don't know, thank me or shout at me, depending on what they feel about this. Um, and yeah, I guess, yeah, that's probably the, the best places to, to follow me. And if anyone has any obviously, feedback, also ideas how to get the information out, you know, I'd appreciate that as well. Well, awesome. It's been just terrific having you on and and interacting with you on the forum has been great too. So I know we'll stay in touch. Thanks again so much. Thank you. It's been brilliant. Thanks a lot. All right, buddy. Cool. I don't know. I don't know if, uh, if I, if I did the job here, but Hey, I would love it. 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 It is. I want to help get this out. I'm totally sincere about that. Tell me who's been approaching you that I can help make some kind of, Mm -hmm. you know, mini documentary or film or something. You must know some people. I know you know some people that have come to you and said, Bruce, this is important. Let me help make that happen. Well, I don't know. I mean, my my literary agent has tried. He's reached out to a couple of people. We tried um, Prometheus because of Ancient Aliens, you know. Um, they passed on it, I think, perhaps because they feel like some of the t- they haven't said why, but I suppose some of the topics in it they've covered in other episodes, so maybe they they, they didn't want to. Um, also, he's I think he's tried a couple of other production companies, but we haven't at the moment got anyone. I tried reaching out to Gaia because I know that they cover strangeness and they said that they don't take at the moment, they're not taking external stuff. It's just, you know, whatever they're coming up with in house to, to do. Um, they've said, look, that might change. We might come back to you. Um, so no, there's nothing. I, I really think it needs to be in a visual format, to be honest. Um, and I don't at this point have anyone to do that. I, I, I'm going to probably try to do some, I don't know, video or YouTube or, or something to try and get some information. Out, but it really needs to have a professional documentary team or someone right. to put this together. Because, right. Agreed. Mm. Um, well, let's just I'll put some that. let's just put some thought and energy into it. And uh, so I'm I'm interested in helping fund that. I'm not interested. I'm not worried about mm-hmm. the return on it. I'm interested in the mm-hmm. information reaching people. So please consider me for as a resource yep. in that way. And okay. I will try and, you know. Yeah, if you've got them. ideas about how that can be done, or even an initial teaser promo kind of show where we give some, you know, anything that can give you know, I realize visual format as well as, of course, you know, a lot of people now downloading you know, audio, but I mean, you know, those are the two formats I don't really cover very well. Obviously, apart from interviews that the, you know, that there's a lot of people who won't have this information. Even people I talk to online, they say, well, hey, because it's not on Audible or it's not on YouTube or so that they haven't really accessed it. Um, so, I mean, yeah, any ideas you have about ways to address that, even if it's in small serialized parts, dealing with aspects of it or, you know, anything like that, or if, you know, if you know people that, that do that, you know, or, you know, I mean, obviously there's, I guess there's, you know, there's, people that can be hired to come and film me in the UK, whatever, make, you know, interviews about it, but anything like that, you know, whether it's a series of interviews or a full documentary or, you know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, but yeah, at the moment, my resources just aren't there to do it. As I said, to you, yeah, before. Yeah. I'm, you know, that's my problem is that, you know, we'll get it done. We'll figure out a way like to, to get it done. It's just to, it's, it's, it fits, it hits all the buttons. It's like the most important thing. Mm-hmm. And it's super interesting. It's, and it's like cinemagraphic, you know I mean? We'll, we'll get it done. All right, my man. Okay. That's-
I mean, I appreciate yeah, anything you come up with, like I say, you know, you've been really cool and, you know, yeah, I hope, hope it'll get out there, you know. I, I, I hope it will too. You're fantastic. And if you want to do the more esoteric one another time, just let me know. And then, we, uh, will. Me and Daddy we will. We will. jump on and... We will, and I'll just figure out a way to, uh, you know, I'll either, I'm intrigued by this other idea, you know, we might just, we'll, we'll, I'll move as quick as I can on it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, let me know. I mean, I, as I say, I'm open to it. I, I'm, in whatever format, if you have ideas of different formats that might work, um, then yeah, we can definitely have a look at it and yeah, see what will work. Great. I don't have any goal other than to help it get out there. So we just work together. Should, you know, it's, yeah, I'm, I'm struggled for that. As you, even just to get the, the, the press to cover the Inter-Africa thing, you know, uh, failure, you know, one, you know, Forbes did one article, deleted it in three hours. So, I mean, at the moment, my access to the greater media is, is just the kindness of various radio show hosts, really, and a few guest articles on independent, you know, media. So that's it. And obviously that's not going to reach enough people. Awesome. So, all right. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Take care. I'll speak to you again soon. Okay. Bye. Cheers. Take care. Bye bye. Thanks again to Bruce Fenton for joining me today on Skeptico. As you can tell, I was quite enthusiastic about Bruce's theories and his research. So, I have one basic question to tee up What if Bruce and Daniela Fenton are right? Now, one of the reasons I have to tell you I was so enthusiastic about this interview is because all of the great input I got from Skeptico listeners through the Skeptico Forum before this interview. And I'm hoping we can pick up that dialogue now that this interview is published because I plan on doing a lot more with Bruce and Daniela because I think the question, the hypothesis, the research that they propose is incredibly important. If it's true, if and only if it's inquiry to perpetuate doubt, skeptical style true. So do join me over in the Skeptical Forum. Tell me what you think. Tell me how we would go about um, nudging towards the truth on this. And then while you're there, of course, check out the Skeptical website where you'll find all these shows and all our other shows, 420 or whatever of them, available for free download on MB3. You can download them, share them with other people you think would be interested in hearing this, and I hope you do that. So again, you're going to hear more from Bruce and Daniela, so stick around for that, and stick around for some pretty interesting other shows I'm downplaying, and I have some really good interesting shows coming up, and some that are less interesting, but some really good ones. Stick around for all of that. Until next time, take care, and bye for now. (laughs) 